All right, what's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Living the Dream podcast. Today on the show, we have Kevin O'Connor, who is the author of Two Floors Above Grief. Kevin, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks a lot, Tim. Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate I uh, appreciate all the setup and everything you've done uh, to coordinate this. I enjoy being guests and, and talking on podcasts. So thank you very much. Of course, man. Thanks for coming on the show. And we like to jump right in. So if you could start with telling us a little bit more about yourself and what you like to do for fun, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. Fun. Okay. Well, for fun, I I, I have uh, I enjoy bike riding, and uh, although I have probably have I'm getting I haven't done as much lately as I used to, but I enjoy the the quest. And uh, when I say the quest, I in one of my bios I talk about the activity I've had in a uh, an event called Smart Ride, which is an annual event that goes from Miami to Key West. It's 165 miles. We do it over two days. It's a fundraiser for uh, HIV awareness, education, and and uh, services. So, um, for, but I have it, it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I do for fun, I, I, I do theater and I'm pretty active in community theater and have been for a long time. Um, and that's always been a nice supplement to my career in education and other things that I've been doing. Um, and um, I'm been retired from education for three years. Uh, I this is I'm celebrating my 50th year as an educator. I started in 1973, and here's 50 years later. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even though I'm retired, I, I still stay active in in different community groups here in, in Broward County and other places that are working on educational issues. And and uh, even this week, I attended a board meeting to 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 speak and to to state my my views and things. So I I keep up to up with that and the. But the big focus of my life the last two, two years has been uh, writing and getting this uh, book, Two Years of Two Floors Above the Grief, uh, written and edited and uh, designed. And I'm self published. So, uh, in terms of, you know, when you talk about living a dream, I've always wanted to write this book and, uh, or, I've always wanted to write a book, yeah. and then it, it was it was in the last six, seven, eight years that I, I decided what I was going to write about, and and am living that dream, and now I'm living the dream of telling other people about it. So that that's that's what brings me to you today. There we go. Well, tell us a little bit more about your motivation. You know, you've been wanting to write this book for six, seven, eight years. What really gets you up and keeps you going every day, and what's your motivation behind the book? Well, the motivation gets, I, I, I have a uh, pretty much a routine, uh, so, so, sort of, not a routine that I, I go, uh, okay, it's 11 o'clock, I got to do this. Not that kind of routine, but I, I've got my body into a, a point where I pretty much wake up at the same time and I get up at the same time and spend some time walking, the, the, getting the dog out and having breakfast and then going for a walk with my husband and uh, with the dogs. So I, I guess part of what, um, and I'm liking that routine, when I first started the writing process um, with a class I was taking, you know, they talked about the importance of routine. And if we had, if we were going to meet the goal of getting our writing done, we really had to set aside a time every day. And they recommended a set time every day. Some of the people in the class and even the instructor said, get up in the morning right away and do it. But I, but she said, yeah, but you could set it up according to your own time. And and being retired allowed me that privilege, I guess. So that's when I, well, I knew I didn't want to give up on the, um, on the routines I'd already established. And so I set up a, by 10, 30 or 11 every morning, I was, I was, I had finished that part of the routine I just talked about. And then um, I was ready to start and, and get myself into the same desk that I'm sitting at now and start the, and start writing. And then I pretty much stayed here um, till about three or four o'clock. And I did that pretty regularly Monday through Friday, sometimes on the weekend, but I wanted to preserve that as well. So it was those working those 20 to 25 hours a week and, and being involved in the writing process is what helped me get it accomplished over about a seven month period to get, to get the book ready enough, the, the manuscript ready enough to turn to an editor. So uh, I guess I think it was, I look back and I think it was that routine that did that. Um, right now I'm trying to recapture some of that routine and to stick to knowing that it worked for me once. Now that I'm in the marketing process, 
um, and have the and learning the tools to do that. I I have to just really work on uh, preserving that eleven to three time every day, yeah. or if I have to give up something in, a, in that eleven to three time, make it up later. So I, I I'm looking at that still four hours a day, uh, five days a week type thing. Um, that and I think that's I don't think I know that's what helped me get the book written and and i'm using that as a model to help get the book marketed now i got you i got you and the book two floors above grief six seven mm -hmm. years ago how did you know that was the topic you wanted to write about okay well the topic uh, the subtitle of the book is a memoir of two families in the unique place we called home I was uh, I was born in 1950 as the son of an as the son of an undertaker. Uh, I had an older brother and a younger brother that came a year later, and we lived on the third floor uh, of a Victorian house. Uh, the first floor was a, a funeral home that was operated and owned by my father and my uncle, my uncle and my aunt and their three daughters who were about 15 to 20 years older than me. They lived on the second floor. So we were, when I talk about two families in the unique place we called home, it's our two families that lived above the funeral home. And um, I'd been told, I mean, just experiencing it as a kid in, in this, our Midwestern town of Elgin, Illinois, I knew it was pretty unique. I, I, I had a, one other friend that, uh, and another family member that were part of the funeral home business. But all through grade school and high school, I was pretty much the only one. And even when I got to college and met a few more friends, I'd meet a few more. But I knew that my life was pretty unique. And um, the other thing that made propelled me to write the book was the a collection of letters that had been gathered over the years, mostly written, oh, written in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and uh, mostly from my parents to me or me to my parents or me to my cousins or just a host of maybe other people in the family. All those, my, most of those letters were saved. And I had these, as people found these letters, they gave them to me. I saved some of my own. And in, the, in my about 10, eight to 10 years ago, I thought, well, what am I gonna do with all these letters? And well, I, then I sequenced, I put them in a sequence order, spread them all out over my living room floor for a period of about a week or two. And then once I got them into sequence, I put them into plastic sleeves and, and that were put them in four, uh, four inch binders. And then I had these letters, some of many of which I've read periodically because every time I moved or moved a box, oh, I'd pull one out and read it. But now they were in an order, sequential anyway. And then as I read through them, I thought, hey, there are some stories here. And um, you know, a lot of times when people write memoirs, I learned, they do it in sequential order. And I thought, but this book, and thank goodness I had the training I had at the classes I took that said there were certainly options in memoir writing. And so I decided to base this book more on themes and the characters and the letters, uh, 700 pages of letters um, were able to help me i knew the characters i lived with them but it was their authentic voice from the letters that they had written or typed or scratched in their own hand on stage bits of stationery or however they did them they edited them they did them in a variety of ways but as i would then organize when i organized my thoughts and organized how i wanted to approach the book and then started writing there was a certain authenticity um in typing those words from the letters into my word program as I wrote the stories, because I knew it was their, their words telling the story. Um, I, certainly, I have my own commentary in there, but a, bulk, a, a good portion of the book is the actual words of the people that I tell about. And I, I think that was another driver. I, and this research I did with the, the letters and knowing there were stories that added to the uniqueness of our story, that added into the uniqueness of our family structure of two families living in apartments that were joined. We didn't have separate doors. I, To get to my apartment, I had to, um, where I lived, I had to walk through my aunt and uncle's apartment. Mm. So they were like surrogate parents. And, and we, uh, although we didn't eat meals together very often, we 
we we cross paths every day, three or four or five, six, seven times a day. So it was it was a family of of uh, ten people, with assorted cousins, aunts, uncles, in laws, in and out. You know, so it was it was quite an arrangement. And then to to add the atmosphere of the funeral home on the first floor, uh, that's where the title comes from. Two floors above grief, because there was certainly uh, grief uh, in the funeral home and in the, with the families that were there. We were above, not that I, I don't say above that we were more important than the grief or that we were um, better than the grief. Not at all. Above just means our location and how our lives, um, how our lives existed as families uh, along with the, the families that were, that were experiencing the grief of losing a loved one. I got you. So talk to me a little bit about that being two floors above a funeral home. Mm -hmm. um, how did that, did that impact you at all? What did, did it only impact you on Saturday and Sunday? Like, how did that, I don't know. Do they have funerals every day of the week? I feel like they do. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Usually I'm not sure. Again, my, my family, uh, I mean, I was acquainted with the industry more intimately from my birth until 1984 when my family sold it. So uh, although the building and the funeral home business is still there, it'll be, uh, in, it's 92 years in, in business now, um, 93 this year uh, in business with, with the same name. Um, but how did it impact me? Well, part of it, it impacted me, I guess, as I realized it as I got older, as a, even as a kid, I didn't really know any different. <laughs> yeah. uh, and um, that was just what life was. And um but um, I've talked about this at different book clubs I've been to and other uh, people that have shared similar experiences or work in funeral homes. There's this concept that um, the family of the, of the funeral home directors, my dad and my uncle and, I, and my mom and my aunt were, uh, they didn't really work directly in the funeral home, but certainly they were involved in our community. Um, we were all ambassadors. Uh, and it, where our town was small enough that we had about 50, 60,000 people in the town, but um, the town was small enough that when I was out riding my bike or at the swimming pool or doing my paper route or whatever it was I was doing, active in high school, elementary school, college, people knew the last name. And so my uncle and my dad, you know, when you go out, you know, be sure to have a good time and enjoy yourself, uh, make good decisions. But remember that what you do is going to influence the business as well. And because people would uh, react to what our behavior was like. And fortunately, <laughs> through all those talks I had with my, my parents uh, and my aunt and uncle, I'd have to say that the behaviors of myself and my two brothers and my, my three cousins was was okay. <laughs> I don't think we did anything that would disparage the business at all. Uh, I like to think that we probably helped the business through the activities we did and the work we did in the funeral home and the respect that we showed for the families that were there. So um, when in the, in the title that when I say it's a unique place we called home, certainly I had kids in my class that and in my classes that whose families had a business on their premises, whether it was the my friend Mike, whose dad was a printer, or my friend Mary, whose dad was the pediatrician that I went to, uh, or uh, another friend whose dad was a lawyer and had his law office in the back of their house. They're uh, a plumber, <laughs> uh, TV repairman. Uh, they ran their businesses out of their houses, you know. Uh, and so I, I wasn't unfamiliar with that, but there was still something unique about uh, our business and the kinds of things kids would ask me um you know did was the house haunted did i get scared um what's it like living living like that and in my parents were wonderful in making our house a welcoming place it wasn't they ever said your friends can't come over so our house was probably like uh, the friends of the houses of some of my friends where we'd hang out and do things and Come over, kids would come over and watch, you know, watch TV, play cars, play baseball in the backyard, basketball, uh, just the things that you would do at other friends' houses. And I, as I keep, I do a pretty good job of keeping acquainted with my childhood friends. And, you know, they just say that 
they they have mem good memories about being in our house, even though it was our apartment was above a funeral home. But once they got upstairs, they really didn't think about as we were playing 45 RPM records or listening to TV or um, d dancing or whatever we were doing upstairs. Um, they, they didn't think, gee, this is a funeral home. No, they would say this is Kevin's house. We're playing yeah. in Kevin's house. So I, I think um, those those were some influences that that occurred, you know, being in the town and having the, this business uh, of being in, a fu in the funeral industry, which I think um, it's 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 one of the uh, it's an industry that we all of us have encountered in our lives. <laughs> it's yeah. hard for a person to avoid a funeral home. It's like it's not easy for a, a, a young mom to avoid an obstetrician <laughs> or a midwife or uh, somebody that's going to help through the entry into life. It's the same way. Um, you know, people uh, have a, have numerous benchmarks in their life where they need the counsel, the assistance and the support of somebody in the funeral industry. So yeah. I, I think that that's that's part of what I saw as a kid, uh, what I knew as, as some of my friends' families would come through the home, the house, you know, I'm, um, some of my friends would help in the funeral home with being pallbearers. If uh, my dad didn't have enough pallbearers for a funeral or if, if a family, uh, if a certain deceased person didn't have a family, had been homeless, was just found on the street, and maybe didn't have anybody to come to their funeral and support their 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 transition. My dad would say, "Call your friends. I need some. I need some pallbearers." And dad would sit us all down and tell us what he knew about the the person who had died, and teach us how to carry the casket, teach us how to show respect, teach us what to do when we got to a church or a cemetery. Um, and it became uh, some of my friends and we're now in our seventies. They still talk about that. They still talk about that 60 years later about some of the lessons they learned in, in helping at the funeral home. Hmm. So. I got you. So it wasn't anything super abnormal in your childhood, but it was a, um, it was like a point of talking amongst you and your friends, but it didn't mm -hmm. like take the main light. Great. That's a great way to put it, Tim. Yeah, it, it, it didn't, uh, certainly it came up in conversations and it came up um, and I knew there was, as I talked about us being am ambassadors, you know, there's a certain amount of discretion that we were advised to use. Uh, I didn't, it wasn't my nature to go because sometimes I didn't even know, you know, because I was doing so much my own thing. I might not know the name of the family Who's, who was being waked and having their funeral. Um, a lot of times I did, but um, it wasn't a point of conversation. You know, and when I rode my bike to go to the swimming pool with my friends, it was, you know, whatever we were talking about. Yeah. And any more than um, my friend, even though I had, I had a lot of friends whose fathers and mothers had different occupations, but when you're a kid or a teenager, I... I think that's true for most. We don't talk a whole lot about our parents' jobs, you know. Uh, I, you know, when I think of family shows on TV now, or one on TV then in the '50s and '60s, not a whole lot of time was spent with the kids talking about what their dad did or what their mom did for their occupations, and that was the case for me too. So, I mean, people knew my father was an undertaker. Um, you know, they might ask me, "What's it like? Uh, do, do you ever watch your what? What happens when the body dies?" or but I was never a, an observer of of the the science part of it, the embalming part of it. Uh, so I had no information to give, and I think that was by design. Because um, it was by design, and it was out of respect to the families. I mean, um, there were certain laws, but there was also certain levels of respect. So I think even if I wanted to watch my dad in the process of preparing the body. He he wouldn't he wouldn't have allowed that you know he wouldn't have said that's where this is where we this is where we draw the line. <laughs> you yeah. can help and you can help in so many other ways. You can set up chairs, take down chairs, dust the furniture, help people get up the stairs if they couldn't get up the stairs to the funeral home. You know, help with the flowers, 
put them up, take them down. Um, like I said, pall bearing. Any there's any number of things that we did cut the lawn, um, but there was that level of respect for the family as well. That um, I, I've only put this together recently in writing the book. You know what would it have been like if a family had um, got wind or got word that hey the undertaker let his kids you know watch watch my loved one get embalmed or be prepared. Uh, I don't think that would have sat very well with a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. So, and that was my dad and my uncle and the people that worked for them were very good about that, you know. So the business was never really hidden from us in terms of what it was about, but there was this, there was, there was boundaries. There were boundaries that were set and rarely did our dinner times upstairs. Um, and I guess for me, dad didn't come up to dinner and talk about, you know, everything, what was going on downstairs. Yeah. I mean, he, he, he just kept that private and and for the family so it, it was i guess that's part of what makes it unique but again again i have to think i'm not sure what your dad did or your mom did but i i i, I uh as i talk to other people as i get older you know they didn't have a lot of conversations at their dinner tables about what their parents did yeah. and stuff either it was you talked about usually i think parents what i did with my own kids you talked about what the kids were doing and what was school what was going on in school and and uh you know that kind of thing and tried to engage i tried to engage my kids as my parents did me in their next activities and arranging our lives around their activities and what was going on so that was it was similar yeah yeah no absolutely i feel that um mm -hmm. yeah i barely remember what my parents did so Probably rings yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, cool. Let's go ahead and jump into your dreams and goals. What's your vision for the book? My vision? Mm -hmm. Well, um, my vision is to, um, I think the book has some uh, application. It's been, uh, I'm enjoying the marketing process and enjoying what I'm learning about marketing and getting the book sold and being on podcasts like this or, or doing other types of marketing um, outreach through uh presenting at book clubs, either online or in person, going, doing bookstore events, um, uh, getting, getting the word out. And I enjoy the discussions. Some of the questions and some of the stories come up there. just like they're here. Um, the other vision for the book is I, um, I want to, I want to get more out into the funeral home industry, which I have been doing to uh, talk to other uh, people in the industry about the book and to see what connections they have with it. A lot of, there are a number of undertaking people in the profession that were maybe raised in a similar way to how I was or are raising their own kids that way. I was talking to a, a colleague yesterday who works in the funeral industry and, and uh, she, we, uh, she expanded my vision just recently about, um, you know, this is probably a, a, a good book to, put in the hands of students that are working to get their certificates in mortuary science or funeral directing or embalming, being part of, of that industry. And because there's lessons in here, there's lessons in the book about how to start a business, um, how you grow a business. Uh, there's lessons in here about the, what I mentioned before. How do you, how do you raise a family uh, alongside your business? Yeah. Um, how do you, um, how do you uh, practice respect and discretion <laughs> at the, while at the same time being very active in your community and, and doing the outreach you knew you need to do to promote your business. How, where do where, where the, where do you draw the line? So I think based on some recent conversation, my vision has been enriched just in the last 48 hours thinking I want to do some outreach to uh, the, the mortuary schools, some of which are two-year programs, some of which are four-year programs, just to get, to try to create some opportunities to let them know about the book. The other thing about the book, uh, the part of the vision is that it's done from a historical perspective starting in 1930. So how has the funeral home business changed over those years? Um, that, so that's one vision. The other vision is, is to play more with this idea of the letter writing and how people communicate and the contrast between letter writing of the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, to the way we communicate now with text and email and what what are the, what are the likenesses and differences 
uh, one of the things that's come out in some of the discussions, my family as have as other families have done, say had letters that were saved, whether it had been love letters between a couple or letters from a grandma to a grandchild or and people save those cards and letters. But now with our communication, how many people really press print on their emails and put them in a file, whether electronically or in a manila folder to save that collection and to to do the kind of thing I was able to do, um, you know, with putting my letters together thematically. So I, I think there's something to do with that. And then also, I really like the other vision I have is to talk to people that are doing ancestry type searches. And how, how do you find the stories of those people? When you go to Ancestry.com or 23andMe or the other ones, it's a name and a date and a location and how everybody's connected. But how do the stories connect? How do those, what do those pictures mean that you put on your ancestry sites? So that's another vision that I have, uh, a dream, I guess you call it, in a way to, to help the book expand. There we go. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. What are the top one to two skills that you need to develop right now to make some of these dreams and goals come true? Oh, great question, Tim. <laughs> um, I, um, one of the top skills I need to develop because what I've learned about self-publishing in which, and I'm not sure what the percentages are, but a good percentage of books now are self-published. And when you hear the word self-publish, that word, that's a four letter word itself, meaning you really have to do it yourself. There's plenty of support out there. So, uh, but what I need to learn and what the skill I want to do is just keep honing my skills with all the different things that go into social media, because that seems, and everything I've learned about self-publishing it comes back to media, social media. So that's a whole skill. I mean, I talked about the difference between letter writing and then email and social media and all the other outlets we have. Such a contrast. So, you know, my 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 uncle and my dad sold their funeral home business by community outreach and being visible and uh, putting ads in newspapers and things like that. Um, now, um, it's different. So the skill I have, even though I developed skills when I was a prince, teacher and principal in um, some, I grew up with, I mean, I, my career had to grow with social media. I mean, there was a time in my job, we didn't even know what email was. So I, I'm pre-email. So I saw that whole thing develop. I'm pre-Facebook. I'm free, pre all that stuff. Yeah. But for me, um, I have to keep working on those skills and I, I envy and treasure uh, younger folks like yourself um, who, who, you pro who you probably more readily adapt to this and you can, you can put a, a reel together or, or any one of those things. I, I, I have to, I have to work on that and, and, and really concentrate on that and, and know, you know, know more about what it takes to capture a person's mind in a, in a, in a brief moment. Um, and, and I think that's, that's part of, it's an advantage and disadvantage. I have the advantage of having seen this all historically for 70 years, but now in order to, to, to get the word out, it's, it's, it's much different, uh, especially without a publish, publisher doing this myself, it's much different. And I have to, I'm learning, Hey, whether I'm was you know born in 1950 or living in 2023, there's still only 24 hours in a day. <laughs> yeah. that, that that hasn't changed. So I guess part of that, uh, those next steps, um, what am I? What's my learning curve? Um, it's just picking one thing at a time, trying to concentrate on that, and then doing and learning. Yeah, learning one thing at a time, and how's that going to propel my outreach? So that's that's the challenge that I have. I got gotcha. you. I got you. So honing those social media skills and really concentrating and maximizing your time on one thing at a time. Yeah. And the beauty of it is, um, I was just thinking about this in my walk. The beauty of it is there's plenty of, there's no lack of resources. There's yeah. no, and you, I'm sure you know how social media works is if I'm looking for a pair of pants and I put a request in for a new pair of jeans, somehow or another, I get inundated with ads and yeah. you're stuff. probably going to get some ads about some jeans just by saying, yeah, just, just, by, just by now, just by now. 
but the same thing as soon as i in the last six to 12 months when i put something out about you know what's what's the best way to market a book or how do i how do i use uh computer design to make my uh images and things sure enough i get um advertisements about here's the best thing ever so yeah. i guess what i'm leading up to is it's easy for me to get overwhelmed so as i make these list of things i need to do i have to then say ah there's so much to do and then i let myself think where do i then i get back to some old things i have to relearn where do i start but there's so many resources out there it's the it's a sifting process and a reprioritizing all the time and saying today what's the most important thing to try to get accomplished today and then have a i have like a list in my head about what i want to get done over a week's time but then i have to i have to change that list every day because the the priorities might change or so if i'm putting four or five hours a day aside to do marketing i still have those other eight twelve 13 15 hours where i still want to get some exercise in or we got a situation at home got to do the grocery shopping got to walk the dog you know the things that we all do um for our families so i guess that's that's i think that answers your question i think i don't know yeah no it does for sure it does okay for sure. okay all right well awesome we um hope this next question will help you a lot ben what are the all right. impact daily actions that are going to tick the needle forward towards your dreams and goals of getting this book out there. I think I answer. I think I wrote you this now. Let's see if I can recall it, but <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'll, I'll, I'll speak off. I'll, I'll speak from right here from the chest. So uh, just to rephrase your question, is this, what are the top things I need to do every day? Is that what yep, you're saying? That's it. Okay. Top things you need to do every day. Okay. The top things I need to do um, are just, if I haven't made some sort of a handwritten list the night before, just do that in the morning and say, okay, what is it that I, I want to get done? And I've learned not to make the list too long <laughs> because if I sat and spent time on the list, there might be 20 things on it. And I, I think, Hey, that, that list is pretty long. If I can just like today, I wrote on my list, uh, where was it that I want to work on getting, I, I do a monthly newsletter so uh, I want to work on getting my newsletter out and and then I want to do uh, take a look at some notes from a class I took two weeks, two weeks ago. And so I, I just wrote those two things down. And actually, here it is into the evening. And I was able to get the newsletter started and I was able to gather the notes I needed. So that's what I put on my list. And I have a sense of accomplishment. Yeah. So so um, if I if I spent five more minutes this morning making that list and wrote 20 things i i probably wouldn't have felt like i had anything done but i guess what i've learned through this process and trying to um hmm, remedy the overwhelmingness is not to make my list so inclusive just to uh take a look at my day and say what are two things i'd like to say by the end of the day that i've worked on doesn't say yeah. i've finished them doesn't say i've finished them but that that i've worked on and i have to i have to pat myself on the back this evening to say i did that so uh, what i'll do tonight is to say okay what's going to happen tomorrow tomorrow's friday what two or three things do i want to get done tomorrow and and do what i can to get those done so um and then I, I put other things mentally on the list, like I want to make sure I walk an hour a day or do something an hour a day. And I've been doing that. So I don't even put that on the list anymore because I, I want to make that just part of who I am and what I need to do. So I do that. So that's what's working for me right now, Tim. Is uh, And it's been working for me for a little while now. And I think I'm just going to keep at that. And, and I it helps me to feel less overwhelmed and, and feel more accomplished and just feel like, okay, I, I am getting to a spot. And one more thing, I have to give myself credit and recognition and affirmation for getting the book done and whatever other tasks I'm doing. Just, I, I go to a counselor and um, even after the hour we talk, she'll say, um, put your hand on your heart and she'll say, what do you acknowledge about the hour we just spent together? 
and that's been pretty powerful for me um just to to take that time and a minute just to give myself uh, i guess self credit or give myself some some recognition so and that helps me propel myself to the next task or helps me to say hey i can do this yeah it's just i have to i have to make sure my steps are not necessarily sequence, but just make sure they're small. They're they're small enough that I have a sense of accomplishment. So that's 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 where I'm at with that answer to that question. One hundred percent. There we go. I like okay. it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. What character trait do you most need to develop right now to make your dream life come true? Uh, um, the character trait probably. Um, well, the first word that came to mind, I'll just, is, is patience. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, is just, and I guess that goes with the affirmation and the acknowledgement is, is just to be patient. Um, I, I didn't get to this point in my life for everything happening at once. Yeah. Uh, I've had, you know, 50 years in education and other careers here in well, not, my major career is education, but within within the jobs i had in education i i probably did some of the same things that you and i are talking about right now i i did what was laid out for me for each day i i tried to put get balance in my life and and just go up and go to the next day so i guess the character trait still not guess it, it is this patience part and and everything is it's going to have it the things i want to happen will happen i I can't really rush them because I'm, I only have the same amount of time as everybody else has. So, but, I, but I know I've been able to accomplish things in my life or I wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation with you. I just have to keep telling myself patience, uh, acknowledge what's worked for me, uh, in the years past, keep, keep doing that. Just keep doing it, keep doing it and make, make alterations and make adjustments. But, just let myself know, hey, just, just, just take time. It's going to take time. So, yeah, that, that's 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 an approach that is working for me. And I I, I want to get things done. And every when I look at my sales charts and think, oh, I wish I I wish I was selling more big books by this point. But I thought, well, on the other hand, <laughs> if you hadn't done what you've done already, you wouldn't have sold the ones that are there. You know, so. Yeah. Uh, just keep keep doing what you're doing, and I know there's a multiplier effect in sales and this kind of thing. So uh, the more people that have the book in their hand, the more people I get a chance to talk to, the more people um, that um, it, it's exponential. Yeah. And when you talk exponential, uh, you you may see it in algebra, but it it still takes time. It still takes time. So that's that's what's been happening and working for me. So love it. Okay. Patience, patience, patience. Yeah. What if there were one or two people you can meet right now? It could be a specific person or a type of person, and they'd really help you take that next step towards your dreams and goals. Who would they be, and how would they help you? Okay. Living or dead, I presume. <laughs> uh let's go living. Let's go living because we want to be able to introduce you to them and actually get the help. Uh, as soon okay. As well, the first person that comes to mind is is is, is Pete Buttigieg. And um, uh, I had the good fortune to uh, 2019 and, and um, 20 to be a part of his campaign. Pete Buttigieg? Uh, uh, huh? What's his name? Pete? Oh, he ran for president. Pete, Pete Buttigieg? Oh, dude, I didn't. I don't even know who that is. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Well, uh, yeah, he was in the news. Uh, it's it's boot edge edge. You could say it, uh, boot edge edge. That's how you pronounce it. Boot oh, edge. I got you. I got you. Okay, edge. and he was right. one of the Democratic candidates for. Uh, he was in the debates in 2019. One of many in the debates. He won the Iowa primary in 2020. He's now um, the head of the Department of Transportation uh, for the government. And probably has some aspirations to maybe get back into presidential politics. But uh, I've read his books. I've been, uh, I did have a chance to meet him and shake his hand and do things as we worked on the political campaign. But that would be one person that I would like to spend time with. And his husband, uh, Chaston, they have done um, such enormous things for um, 
their 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 pol political life plus what they're doing now in Washington and with their family they have two children now and so I think they have a lot to teach a lot of people so that's definitely um, a person Pete would be one person that I want to spend some more time with um, for sure for sure mm -hmm. there we go there mm -hmm. we go and we want to leave it at Pete or do you want to add somebody Add somebody else. Oh, you don't have boy. to. You don't have to. We can move on. <laughs> no, um, let's just move on. For that's that'd be one. I'll probably think of some others. But uh, but um, I've often, well, I guess the people I met on that campaign and the people I've met on other political. I'm pretty politically active, and with volunteer things and locally and and state and national wise, uh, I love enjoy spending people that are involved in the political process. So Pete would be the primary one uh, right now, but I, I'd love to spend more time with people are, that are in office right now. Um, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, um, the uh, uh, the governor of Kentucky has been in the news lately, but sure, I'd love to spend more time with him because he's doing a lot of things um, that are, have been very courageous. And I, I'd like to see, uh, be in the presence of him. So there you go. There you go. Mm -hmm. And what's your favorite book, movie, or podcast? Pick one. Pick one. Um, well, aside from yours. Um, there we go. There we go. <laughs> um, there is a, uh, I think I wrote this. Oh, the, the movie. I think I, when, when I was looking over your questions, the movie that one of the movies that comes to mind is Forrest Gump. Uh, just because, um, the idea that you just don't give up the idea that you you can equip yourself with as much tenacity and forthrightness as your as your being will take you and and you don't you don't put up barriers you don't uh, that's what i got from the movie when i've watched it there you just keep you keep on and um i, I i've uh, referenced him that a couple times or i also the idea that he just kept running and running, or when I think about the play Alexander Hamilton, and when they portrayed when they portrayed Hamilton is he he just can't stop he can't stop writing and he writes and he writes and he writes, and um, such a good, sometimes such a good yeah yeah <laughs> and sometimes I felt that way um, and I've seen I guess I've seen the movie production of Hamilton when they put the Broadway that could be a movie too the way they've put it together in cinema, but the but the idea that um, he like Forrest Gump, you know, didn't he just kept at it, and and people couldn't he didn't he, people couldn't stop him. And I have to say, I felt that way when I was writing sometimes that just keep writing, just keep writing, just keep writing. And uh, that was what my instructors taught me: just keep writing, and then we'll find a way to edit out what you don't need. And I think that's similar to what Gump did in the movie with whatever project he was doing. Uh, or with what Hamilton did in his life, in his young life, he wasn't, you know, he didn't live very long, but what he did in his life as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, awesome. What's one way you like to take care of yourself? Take care of myself. Um, well, uh, to get as, to t keep reminding myself that I have to sleep. So I, I'm pretty, I used to be of a mind where I would think I'll, I'm going to stay up and get this done and then I'm going to go to bed. I did that for even when I was raising my kids, I did that because um, I'd be working on stuff for my job or writing my dissertation or doing stuff for them, volunteering at their schools. And pretty soon it'd be one o'clock in the morning or something. <laughs> oh, if I can just get one more thing done, but I still had to get up at the same time. Yeah. So um, I learned, um, you know, that, that 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 has side effects on health. And a lot of what I've been acquainting myself more is the idea we talked about at the beginning is the whole concept of routine and the importance of taking care of yourself and uh through the meditation i do and through um also the the writing instructor i had who she said you that she said you wanted to you, I, that she wanted us to be disciplined in our writing but don't jeopardize our health <laughs> yeah. um get do the sleep make sure you you unwind make sure you unplug uh and i'm, I'm sometimes i'm better at it than others yeah. but just to to make sure that i unplug 
and make sure that I, I start to evolve into a place where I can rest and then I'll get a sound sleep. But I know if I stay on a screen or if I, um, I, I'll put it that way, if I stay on a screen, whether it's computer or a phone and do that for a long time, um, then that, that jeopardizes me. The one screen I do can get on at night is a Kindle because reading will put me, uh, will put me in a state of sleep. So the, the Kindle is one screen that I allow myself when I'm trying to unwind and, and get the seven, eight, sometimes nine hours of sleep a night that I know my body needs. So yeah, yeah. that's what I do. That's what I do. I got gotcha. you. Well, Kevin, what is one action step you can take right now or continue to take if you're already doing it to kind of meet and work with Pete I can, mm. in, in a more profound way than you already have? Um. Well, just do what I am doing uh, with, I mean, he's busy. <laughs> I just keep up right now for now. I, I keep up with what he, the work that he's doing. I keep aware of what he's doing. Uh, uh, I don't have a correspondence with him or anything like that. Uh, but I, I want to certainly be aware and keep aware of what his aspirations are and be ready to help if I can. And when he, uh, when he's ready um, and keep, uh, you know, what you're what you're talking about here too is telling me, hey, Kev, just you got to write that email, you got to write that letter. If if you want to, I got to remind him, not remind him, just let him know that the interest that he helped me um, instill in in 2018, 2019, 2020, that interest is still there. And even though I'm off writing a book and and doing a book tour and talking to you and he's off raising his family and, and working with his husband and, and doing his governmental work. I, uh, yeah, I still, uh, I'm still there. Uh, they're ready to work and do that kind of those things for him. I want what's better for our country. I want what's better for my state of Florida. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and that's, that's very challenging. Um, but I, I have to, I have to just keep telling myself to, to keep, be patient, <laughs> yeah. but also keep advocating, keep helping where I can, keep keep using my writing skills in ways other than writing a book. Uh, if it's writing letters to a school board member or writing letters to uh, or getting on the phone and being in a meeting with with a, with a local rep or a local uh, organization just to do that. So. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. All right. We're going to jump into our. Final series of the show. Okay. These can get a bit more personal. So if you don't want to answer them, just say I pass and, you know, I'll be like, okay, cool. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Here we go, Kevin. Uh, if there was, do you have, I'm forgetting my question here. What was <laughs> one limiting belief that continues to pop up in your life, if any? Hmm. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is the, it has to do with affirmation because the belief that come the limiting the belief that comes into my mind is I'm not good enough, yeah, <laughs> or I can't do this, or um, uh, I guess that would be summarized like I'm I'm not good enough at this skill, or I'm not good enough in speaking, or I'm not whatever it happens to be. So that that's the limiting belief that probably from the time I, I can I can remember having that statement pop into my head when I was in elementary school. So um, I even talk about it in the book a little bit. Um, so um, I think that's something that's still very it's still a part of me. It's it, it hasn't gone away. It won't go away. But I think what it does do, it, it, it also comes as, it comes as a favor because I think it, it's a thought that comes in. I usually just say, hello, how are you? Hello, thought, how are you doing? What am I going to do about this feeling? I, I, I've i had a fair amount of success in my life, so I know I have conquered this before. I just have to t tell myself, you can do this. You can learn that new computer skill. You can learn that new technique in social media. You can um, you know, help that next political candidate um, get what they're looking for. So, but that's the that's thought that, that comes in that's a limiting thought but then i have to, i learned sometimes it's advantageous to be a senior for me um senior 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 citizen 
yeah. because I, I know I can look back and say, hey, you've gotten, you've, you've I don't want to say I'm the word that came to mind. You've beat this before. I'm going to say you've accommodated this before. You've worked through this before. You've met this challenge. Um, and, and so you can meet it again. So there we go. But I, I think that I think those that limiting belief is still intended as a gift to me. It's it's still it's a way to it's an undercurrent that keeps coming up to say, hey, buddy, you can do this. Don't don't let don't let this question be per pervasive in your mind. Yeah, so, that's a great mm -hmm. perspective on it. And I actually took out the rest of the questions I had on limiting. <laughs> that's good. Um, so I guess we could jump to our last question. OK. What is your favorite belief about yourself? Uh, <laughs> the first thing that came to mind, Tim, was the favorite belief is I can do this. I yep. guess it's just the opposite. Yep. Um, but that's what first popped into my head. And um, what I'm thinking of, and when I say I can do this, uh, uh, a, po a thing that popped into my mind was uh, some theater classes I'm taking. Or I'm I've taken them not recently, but often in the last six years. And um, when somebody suggests to me a certain song to sing, or a, or a, a scene to portray, or a role to play in a play, it, uh, uh, it, whether I, I audition for it or somebody approaches me to say, "Can you do this?" Yeah, I can do it. So I, I and I might still have that inkling of that little voice that says um, the limiting voice that comes in, but I, I guess one of the things that keeps me going is I can do this. Hey, you can do this. Just uh, don't dwell on the the negative part. I'm I'm pretty much a a, a cup. I'm more than half full. <laughs> you you know the adage about a cup half yeah. full or yeah, yeah. Cup. so. Um, I like to think my cup is more than half full. And um, I just keep telling myself when somebody, when either I present myself with a challenge or somebody presents me with a challenge or somebody asks me for something, I like to say, I can do this. I can do this. So there we go. That, that, that's part of what propels me. Well, awesome. Kevin, that's all we got for you, man. Thanks for coming. Okay. On well, well, thanks. I look forward to uh, getting more acquainted with your podcast. I must admit, I've only listened to one or two or th two of them, I think, but I want, but just through your outreach and stuff, I know more about you and uh, I've enjoyed my time with you. Um, I hope uh, your listeners can get acquainted with my book. They can go to my website, uh, Kevin O'Connor author.com. And that tells them a little bit more about me and the book and Two floors above the grief. Two floors above grief. There's no the there. Two floors above grief. It's available at Amazon and uh, all all bookstores. Uh, the bookstores. It's not on a shelf in bookstores, but I haven't been to a bookstore yet that won't order it for somebody, whether it's a you know a chain bookstore or an independent bookstore. So that's that's availability of the book. Yeah. Absolutely. There we go. Well, if you guys are listening to this, you loved what Kevin had to say. You loved the idea of his memoir or know somebody in the industry of funeral services that may like the book. Go ahead and recommend it to them. Go pick up a copy for yourself. Make sure to review him as well. That always helps authors out. And Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Review them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Review those yeah. books. Helps podcasters out too, if you're curious. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know it does. I'll do that for you too. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for watching. We will see you on the next one. All the ways to check Kevin out will be down in the show notes. And on that note, we're out.